Welcome to the 10th edition of the Isla Festival, the Irish, Spanish and Latin American festival in Ireland organized by Instituto Cervantes in association with the Latin American embassies in Ireland and supported by Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. My name is Martina Devlin, I'm an Irish novelist and journalist and joining me today in conversation are writers Louise Nealon and Bruno Gioret, who have both written coming of age novels. Nancy, by Chilean author Bruno, is a powerful, crafted story which traces the arc of the title character's life through memories of her Chilean childhood and a family lost to religion and alcohol. Beautifully written by Bruno, and also, it should be said, beautifully translated into English by Ellen Jones. Now, Louise Nealon made literary headlines when her debut novel, Snowflake, was snapped up for film and TV rights by Element Pictures, which adapted Sally Rooney's Normal People. Snowflake is the story of an 18-year-old girl called Debbie, living on her family's dairy farm with her mentally ill mother Maeve and a boozy Uncle Billy. Debbie is struggling to manage the transition from school to university, from farm to city, and from childhood to adulthood. So you're both most welcome. I want to ask you first, how did you get the idea for your novels? Louise. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me and it's a pleasure to be on with Bruno. Um, so uh, yeah, my novel came to me when I was uh, 18, which is why the main character of my novel is, is 18. Um, and I was, I was struggling quite a bit um, at university. Um, so in that sense, um, a lot of the novel is um, taken from um, details of, of my life, um, emotional details as, as opposed to um, actual details. Uh, I was struggling quite badly with, with my mental health and I dropped out of college um, and I had quite a strange dream um, and when I woke up from the dream, um, I had the feeling that I wasn't uh, inside my head, that I was inside somebody else's um, consciousness. Um, and I felt very uh, uh, violated. Um, and then I went to my GP and uh, naively told him that I had another person's dream. <laughs> and he, so he just... Um, like referred me on to a psychi psychiatrist for a more expensive conversation <laughs> um and the psychiatrist just put me on on medication and, and the dream um wasn't really discussed um and i felt that uh literature and fiction um was a was a way of me um exploring uh that uh um that the difficulty, I felt like I was thrown out of my life um, and uh, in order to get back into the boat, um, I kind of had to uh, scramble around in, in my imagination a bit. And that's how Debbie was born. So I was born very much out of my own circumstances. Um, so you wrote a novel to make sense of something that happened to you? Absolutely. Like Seamus Heaney to set the darkness echoing to, you know, I'm not alone. Oh God, yeah. Like if I could put myself in the same sentence as Seamus Heaney. <laughs> I, I, I just did. I just did. Yeah, you just did. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, I, I basically wrote the novel for my 18 year old self. I'm much, I'm much closer to um, Billy's age and, and Maeve's age now than I, I am um, the, the, main the main character Debbie's age. But uh yeah, I felt like um, I, it was a long gestation period of, of the novel and uh, yeah, it, that's how it became that. And Bruno, was yours a long gestation period and how did you get the idea for Nancy? Um, I, I have just finished to write a novel where um, Nancy was a secondary or even like really peripheric character. Uh, in this novel, the main character um, referred to her as this sort of ghost dying of cancer around the city. And he shared with the readers the, the fact that every time he came across Nancy, he felt like super uncomfortable and disgusted and in pain because this character is super honest in, in what is going on inside him. He says that 
he feels like the presence of, of death. So I just finished that novel, I wa and I was on a bus thinking uh, about what what to write next, and I imagined this this super peripheral character uh, in this other novel, and I said to myself, this is a really possible good story. And so I mixed this idea with two other things. Um, first one, uh, I was in a, um, in a bar and some people were just reciting poetry and somebody recited uh, the first and only Mormon love poet, poetry I've ever, poem I've ever heard. And it was like this, it was really, really brief. It's like almost like a haiku was after 35,000 kilometers uh, and three countries um, uh, on a 3 p.m. Sunday at the end of the street. Uh, Brian, uh, brother Josias or elder Josias kissed elder uh, John for the first time. And that was it, it was a Mormon love poem because it described in a really condensed way this I would say super intense experience between these two elders and how at the end they fall in love, uh, obviously. And the third um, um, factor was that uh, when I was little, there was this really popular telenovela here. Uh, those, eight, those times are remembered as the golden era of Chilean telenovelas because all the people working there were people from theater. So the productions were super good. Uh, and one of these uh, was about gypsies in the north. Um, so I decided to mix uh, these three components uh, on a landscape that was more or less familiar with me. I lived when I was younger um, in the mid-north of the country, like uh, landscapes are similar to those uh, of Greece. Uh, so I decided that that could be a, a good scenario for all these type of life uh, uh, mixing together. So it was um, um, an improvised, uh, it was like a residual idea combined with other things I really wanted to work on. And I realized that the desert uh, was a perfect uh, situation or scenario for this life. So hmm, The desert is your setting, isn't it? The Chilean desert. Um, yeah. So, and Louise mentioned that hers had a long gestation. Did did your novel come together quickly? Yes, um, I I write pretty much all the time, and I, I I'm always writing, and I don't even I don't really publish everything I write. And surprisingly, um, this novel was super quick and fresh. I just wrote. Um, a group of paragraphs describing, let's say, like the storyline. And then I engaged with the writing and it was super fresh and I'm amazed. Uh, it, so I, I, yeah, it was like in four months and then a long, long edition period. Uh, mm. uh, at the beginning, the novel, the novel's character was super different, it was more like a Catholic novel. And the editors, and this is important to say because there's still the idea that literature is like a lonely task. Uh, in my case, a lot of people, mainly uh, editors, worked on the novel. They suggested things and we engaged in different structural problems in the novel after it was finished, the first draft. No? So it was a quick process and it relied on other people as well. So, mm. so, yeah. so both novels have really vividly realized protagonists, young women, Nancy in Bruno's mm -hmm. case and uh, Debbie in Louise's. Louise, which came first, the story or the character? Um, I think there is no story without the character. Um, it, took me, it took me a while to find the story. Um, I... Up until the last, because I'm interested in Bruno said that he wrote down the story within a few short paragraphs, like a like an outline. Well, I can't even imagine doing that um, because I would be completely paralyzed. Uh, all I had really was um, was Debbie and and Billy. It took me a while to find Maeve. They were all in different stories. 
um, at that time. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of um, uh, developing as as a writer as well. Um, so like my style was changing all the time and I, I was finding it difficult to find my voice and um yeah I uh I I start with the with the character um the narration is is important and for, for me and and finding the voice and um they surprise me all the time it's when two characters are having, having a conversation and and um that friction of you think you know where it's going but then they take it somewhere completely different I really love that um and a lot of my job is is trying to catch up with with um my invisible friends or or figments of my imagination who actually they know more than than I do um and sometimes I give them stuff that that's just wrong and it's like they're allergic to it like I try to make um debbie really like um dancing for a while <laughs> and um <laughs> like i like I brought her to you mean going dancing tonight? No, like or an a actual dancer, because dancer, I'm really interested in, in in ballet, and I was like, oh, maybe she'll maybe she like it. <laughs> like as a little girl, I'm bringing it along. So, uh, I, do you know the way? You, like, obviously, like my characters, their passions are, are my passions, um, and I find it difficult to um, separate it like that. But um, yeah, she completely rejected um, the, the whole. Um, dancing thing and then and then the sea swimming she um came through Maeve and uh that was because of a, a book that I was reading at the time and themes of alcoholism came from books that I was reading at the time so they all like kind of melded together and it's in your it's in your consciousness and um you can't help but explore it um but it feels like it's not in my in my control uh when I'm writing or very, very little in my control. It's, it's sort of like sailing or whatever. There's, the conditions are there and there's so many variables. Um, I was intrigued by something you said at the beginning of our conversation, which was that um, it came about, your novel came about as a mm -hmm. result of a dream and you had someone else's dream because that's what happens in Snowflake. One of the characters dreams someone else's dreams. Yeah, Maeve. Um, so the character in Maeve um, developed as uh, ever. Everyone thinks it's based on my mother, <laughs> and my mother is so lovely and so um, practical. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so it, Maeve sort of developed as kind of like a a, a ghost of um, how I could see my life progressing if I didn't kind of um get help um for uh or or settle my my obsession around around dreams because I've quite a rich um inner life and um imaginary um life uh which doesn't really serve for um the practical world uh sometimes I've been incredibly lucky with the way that things um worked out for me um Maeve is your title character's mother. Yeah. And there are mental health issues there. Yeah. So um I basically yeah, I gave um I gave Maeve a lot of my neuroses um and, and put them on steroids. <laughs> sort of. Um it was kind of like the worst case uh scenario. So Maeve is uh she sleeps a lot. Um she is kind of trapped in her in a room. She's um uh, agoraphobic um doesn't go out except to go to mass uh her brother has control of her finances um and she's a young mother but she's really struggling with um motherhood and having to be an authority uh figure and um yeah so uh that in order to write the book um, you say about like how the story came about. I had to condense um, my kind of dream obsession into one character in order to let the story blossom around that because I wanted to put it in everything. And um, it was sort of the Achilles heel in in um, trying to tell the story because it, I, it was imposing on on the storyline when it shouldn't have been. Um, and it's it's something that's really 
difficult to write about um in in many in many ways I, I feel like the dream element of, of of the book is um the least successful part um because it's so it was so difficult because it's such an unconscious uh process and there's such a rich um tradition of um dreams in in literature um and I felt like I was handling fire a lot of the time and I felt like I was out of my depth um but to not for for a long time um the advice that I got around the novel was to leave the dreams out of it um and like let it go Louise <laughs> and um and and I thought at, at some points that it was just like my ego uh, that I wanted to bring the dreams into it as well. But I'm I'm really glad the way that it, it turned out um, because I, I feel like I I stayed true to the the germ of, of the story in in bringing it in, even though um, I'm not like it's not a perfect book um, and it's a failure. But everything you write, I think, is is going to be is going to fall short of of the mark that you set for yourself. Mm -hmm. So Bruno, um, your Nancy is, has similarities to Louise's Debbie in that both are quite vulnerable and they're trying to make their way in the world. Talk us through that. What are the challenges which Nancy faces? Um, I would say that in a social scale, Nancy occupies pretty much the possibly the lowest bottom of society. She's super young and she depends on a really, really intense father that is like into melancholy and depression. Uh, her mother also is um, really hard with her and actually eventually she runs away. Um, so she's so um, unfavored by life that uh, she quickly decides to just move around and explore uh, because she realizes that if she doesn't do that, um, she will drown with her father as well. Uh, it's really interesting that, and somebody commented me this like some years ago that it's incredible how like the entire um, story of when Nancy is wandering around and going to see the gypsy and going to this like the red shore of beach uh, and doing everything. Uh, when she finally escapes from her house, she falls in love with this old man and she got get stuck again in a really vicious relationship with an alcoholic and and she stands this until she's 40 and the husband dies right so like the question is like why somebody uh, that struggled so much and was so brave to just wander around at the end ends with somebody who is in a way a mixture between her father and, and her uncle um, and I don't know, that's, uh, that's a mystery of life. I didn't decide it that way. It just, it just like the story in, in, in that sense, uh, just happened to be like that. Uh, but probably that's related with uh, her cancer, right? Um, cancer as a, in this case, probably a manifestation of she needing to, or having to live with uh, these really suffering people. Um, so when we meet her, she's dying effectively. She's looking back over this short but eventful life. Exactly. And you're trying to find the joy among some fairly desperate happenings. Yeah. I would say that, uh, especially when you're super young, the joy... Um, it's super simple uh, and it relies on things like having a hot dog or, you know, or drinking Coke with your friends uh, at the beach. Uh, really, really simple life, uh, simple things that probably are uh, small escapes from your household, right? Like Nancy's household is really terrible in that sense. Um, 
So while she's remembering her youth, uh, while she's dying of cancer, uh, there's always, even in the saddest moments, uh, um, a tone of sweetness, uh, probably because she's on morphine. So when people are on, on morphine, they, they are also tired. So perhaps that's why the tone is a bit like that. Uh, but yeah, even in some really, really difficult moments, she remembers them uh, with the compassion of a being outside time and space. It's like how you would see humanity if you were like, I don't know, from above, just watching all these people interacting and suffering and, you know, super attached to their own things and their own little words. So in that sense, since the whole novel is narrated through this zero level, this is Nancy dying of cancer on morphine, this is like an like a, um, an in between space between life and I don't know death or whatever else. So that's perhaps why she's able to even ha have some joy on on remember really remembering really really traumatic things. Um, Absolutely, there is a sense of joie de vivre in the novel, even though it deals with very dark events. Something that intrigued me about it was that Nancy is never described. We kind of guess that she must be a very pretty girl because she gets a lot of male attention, but at no stage do you tell us, you know, tall, short, dark, fair. Yeah. Was that, that was a deliberate decision, I imagine. Absolutely. Uh, I am pretty convinced that convinced that um, a professor from Chile said this, that uh, in the 19th century novels, um, there was a lot of description, especially from the indoors places, you know, because people, when they were reading the newspapers or whatever, they wanted to know how, how were these beautiful houses or, you know, what type of cutlery, like people were super curious about uh, beautiful things and uh, any kind of things. I nowadays, think we still are, Bruno. <laughs> I think sorry? we still are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the difference is now, now we have uh, an incredible amount of images in our heads. Right. Because, so in that sense, we are much more capable of um, fulfilling those gaps and really imagining. So now, for instance, if I say to you, like, uh, I was in an old car, I don't really mind about how really the old card looked like, uh, because you will be able to to complete that, uh, and that's for me at least like part of the the exciting aspect of reading in general. Um, uh, that's why also I deliberately uh, like om omitted any possible name of cities or places because the Chilean desert um, could be also other deserts, you know, like this novel could happen in Mexico, in South Africa. I don't know if you have a an Irish desert, but probably a metaphorical one, you know, like uh, an abandoned place with crossroads and people not doing great. Uh, so yeah, that was the, the that was part of a uh, uh, um, yeah, it was completely like thought or conceived in that way. Um, somebody asked me like once, like, how do I imagine Nancy? And I don't imagine her face. Uh, for me, and this might sound a bit like weird, but for me, uh, like, uh, when I write, I try to think of characters as a, a, a group of sentences. Uh, uh, this is to say, um, strategies of speech, speech strategies. Uh, and when I write also, I try to think on processes and not characters. Why? Because if you start a story like just thinking on a character, probably you could imagine an entire life, uh, but you don't have a story. Uh, and then if, uh, like on the other hand, sorry, if you think of processes, you might be able to change a character or remove one. And you don't create attachment to fictional beings, right? Be uh, so in that sense, I maintain a distance. Also because Nancy um, is um, a woman and I am not. So one of the things I really tried to avoid was to create a pink 
pictoresque or picturesque or, you know, like a, a, a character that was constantly saying like, oh, look at me, I am a woman and I was written by a man. You know, that was, um, I think I really wanted to avoid it, to avoid. And the only way I was able, mentally able to do that was just like to imagine Nancy as a group of sentences, uh, really like a, a group of rhetoric strategies. Uh, it's fascinating to hear you say that because to imagine her as a group of sentences would imply that it's quite two-dimensional, but she's a very vividly realised character and she bleeds a lot, I noticed. Um, and But I'll come back to you on that, actually, because I want to bring Louise in again at this stage. Louise, Bruno made the point that we don't have a desert in Ireland, which is entirely true, but we do have an urban-rural divide, and you ventilate that in the novel. Yeah, we have the bog, I suppose. <laughs> it's different. It's wetter. Um, yeah, the urban-rural divide is... Uh, is a kind of like a a conflict that um, drives the the story along. Um, I sorry, I'm just, I'm going back to Bruno the imagining the character as a as a group of sentences. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, but it makes sense um, because well, it works for him, that's for sure. Yeah, um, but there's a there's a quote that I I heard um, someone said. Um, the story isn't inside you, it's in front of you. Um, and that's, I think it's an important distinction. I, I carried around um, my story for a long time inside of me and, and kept it as sort of something that I revered um, and, and something quite nebulous um, and, and felt quite lonely with it. Um, and it's only when you start to write it down and start to break it down, and you, you kind of have to break the the um, break the perfectness of it, you know. Um, and it's only when you take take the characters uh, um, out of the hammocks that that they occupy in in your imagination, and and kind of make them work, um, that the story um, kind of uh, that's the only way you're going to get the story written, <laughs> you know? Um, otherwise, you're, you're just like taking a prolonged uh, vacation in your head uh, with your name imaginary name? friends. <laughs> How <laughs> did the name Snowflake come about? Sorry, um, I didn't even answer your question there. Uh, well, you're not obliged to. What, <laughs> no, no, uh, sorry. It was about the urban-rural divide, really, I was, uh, I was touching yeah. on. Which is kind of mad in a, a country as small as Ireland. As small as Ireland. And, and the fact that Debbie and, and I only live um, 40 minutes away from the city centre. Um, you grew up on a farm, is that right? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, there are I, cows outside that window, Debbie. Is there that are, right? there are. <laughs> <laughs> um, Match that, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barcelona's lovely as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I commuted for college and, and Debbie commutes as well. Um, and it was quite a stark uh, contrast um, between getting up in the morning and being surrounded by um, cows outside my bedroom window and then going to and I, I grew up in quite a traditional home with um my my mom her domain was the home and, and my dad worked outside in in the yard and and then I remember going to college and we were in a tutorial and um uh, I was always afraid that I'd like I uh, smelled of a farm as well <laughs> so I was always really like oh, aware of of like showering properly before like I, I go to college or whatever and um and I was always like in in shabby clothes or what I thought were like my best clothes but other people especially in in, in Trinity um some people have notions and uh wear uh really fancy clothes to tutorials and um the, a lecture said back in the back in the 19th century um there are very like traditional defined roles uh gender roles and like we don't have that anymore and uh, I was just kind of like I, we do <laughs> like it, it, that's not confined to fiction and so um I think the the world we have to find gender roles now still you're saying well I did um at home with my with my 
mother and, and my father. Um, but it my, wouldn't have been traditional to go to university, though. So that was breaking out of the defined gender role. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, 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 I still do think that um, dur- all during my twenties, I, I played up to um, a, ge- a gender stereotype uh, and a perfectionism um, that was quite detrimental. Um, to uh, it comes out in the in the character of of, of Xanthi. Uh, which is um, Debbie's friend when she goes to college, and and Xanthi seems like she has it all together, and uh, she's very knowledgeable about uh, so- social norms, and she seems very powerful in in um, social um, dynamics and stuff. Um, but with with college, I I just felt like there was a stuffiness in in academia, and that was kind of counterbalanced by um, my life at home, which was. Uh, I'd always felt more real um, than anything I could have read in in books, uh, even though I, I found uh, great comfort in books. Um, but the the um, theory around uh, literature, I, I, I struggled with, and I still do um, sometimes. Uh, and how did how did the name Snowflake come about? Right. Because of course, uh, it was a snowflake generation. Uh, yeah. So uh, it comes from a Sylvia Plath poem actually called The Night Dances. Um, and there's a, an image at the end of that poem um, about a snowflake falling. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's a uh, six-sided white on my eyes, my lips, my hair, touching and melting nowhere. Um, and it's a beautiful image of um, this six-sided uh, like moment in time frozen um, and it's a perfect um example of nature uh but it it it's very temporal um and and then I, I started reading about um snowflakes and uh, I got into snowflake uh, uh microphotography um there's this guy he's uh he's Russian and he takes um pictures of, of snowflakes on, on black velvet and they look like ice sculptures. Um, and, uh, and they must melt very, very quickly. So it's the temporal nature. Yeah, it's the, te- it's the temporal nature. And, and the fact that snowflakes, in, in order for them to exist, um, they have to be flawed. Like their, their structure is beautiful, but um, in order for them to exist, uh, they um, trap onto a piece of dust and it, it's dirt, basically. <laughs> and we're all dirt. Um, the and same principle as the grit and the pearl. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Only with, um, with snowflakes, they, um, they melt very easily. And, mm. and with uh, um, the loaded um, kind of... Uh, it's a term in the zeitgeist now and uh the fact that no it's like generation yeah and the fact that it's such a beautiful um description or um um thing in nature can be used as uh such a cynical um slur i found really interesting so it was an attempt to kind of um uh explore that i suppose and were uh, you reclaiming the term were you saying i don't think i like i i uh I don't claim <laughs> to reclaim anything. Um, I just find, found it uh, interesting. Um, and I found it interesting apart from that. Um, and then I felt like it wasn't a good enough reason uh, to not pick it um, just because it was a, a big term in, in the zeitgeist. I, I find it more, I was even more drawn to it then. Well, it occurs to me, as you mentioned Sylvia Plath and the inspiration there, that, of course, The Bell Jar uh, mm-hmm. was also a coming-of-age novel. I, I took it down off my shelf and reread it for the first time since about 1985, and it really holds up. Oh, yeah. You know, sometimes when you go back to a book that you loved at a particular stage in your life, you're a different person and the book doesn't speak to you in the same way, but I felt that Sylvia Plath's only novel uh, did stand the test of time. Yeah, and I love her letters as well and her journals. Um, I, I really, Edna O'Brien actually, um, 
I was reading Edna O'Brien and she uh she had there's a YouTube video of Edna O'Brien reading um Edge by uh Sylvia Plath and it's poems that make grown women cry uh, it's that anthology and uh Edna O'Brien gives a gives a gives a great introduction to that poem um and uh I think they met in real life but they didn't really click uh but I adore uh Sylvia Plath and, and Ted Hughes and um Poetry is really um, something that's really uh, important uh, to sustain, you know, uh, a creative life and um, gives gives plenty of sustenance uh, for, um, yeah, imagination. So mm-hmm. um, I don't think, yeah, I, Sylvia Platt's been a, a massive um, influence and she's been um, under or boxed off um, into this oh, the mad caric- woman in the attic caricature of her of herself mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. someone that's fallen prey to that uh, which is a pity but yeah I love her mm. well each generation can rediscover her now Bruno I left you with a bleeding Nancy um, I noticed that Nancy bleeds a lot when she has sex when she's cleaning she does it till the tips of her fingers bleed what are you saying with all this blood well, uh, in, as part of the basic Judeo-Christian scheme of life, there's this purity and unpurity, right? And uh, blood is one of the, um, let's say, fluids that are not only symbolically super powerful, but also that require uh, to purify a bit. Um, the blood sacrifice. Yeah, but also in the case of um, Nancy uh, bleeding during sex, um, uh, it's, it has to do obviously with this kind of moral dilemma of am I being, I don't know, uh, morally wrong by doing this, like she's going against all of her creed. And when she's after actually she had or she engaged in several uh, casual encounters with the gypsy at her house, she is cleaning the house and she is cleaning really actually at the place where she and the gypsy Jesule had uh, uh, sex. So she's like scratching, scratching, scratching. And then, right, as you mentioned, some like... A, a single drop of blood from each of her fingers drops down and a mystery happens at the Ophany, no? Um, well, and it was yeah. also like the stigmata, you know, Christ stigmata. There was all, there was religious undertones. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I really like um, uh, this sort of scenes because it's not about whether, for instance, Jesus speaks really to Nancy or not. Uh, I like them because as mysteries, they allow you to think whether like, she really saw that or it was just um, an internal experience. Now I'm, reading, I'm writing a novel and I'm reading a really, really interesting essay uh, written uh, by uh, Jung, Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, he wrote on UFOs. Uh, and he he wants to know whether they are real or they are massive uh, projections from the Western civilization uh, in a moment where, like, the Soviet Union and the U.S. had the world divided. So Jung was suggesting that somehow this kind of, like, and he, su- he just suggests that Actually, it might be both. It might be real things, but also there are like some projections from our imagination uh, that is a sign for our own internal psychic well-being. So all of the, like, the religious mysteries that happen in Nancy are somehow related with this. I really agree with Jung. I, I didn't read it before, but it doesn't really matter. Like... Um, it, like those scenes are like somehow like an encounter between Nancy's 
imagination and some signs of reality. Um, and I don't know, also like, to be honest, it's like, it's, there are like things that um, I would love to have. I don't know you, I, I've never had uh, any sort of paranormal encounter, neither with an angel nor with a UFO. Or, but I would really, 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 really love that because it would make me question everything. I, I don't know, it would change your life a bit. Um, one of, there's this short story written by Julian Barnes about an astronaut that goes to the moon and at the moon he uh, hears a voice and it's like an angel or something and the angel tells him like you have to go back to earth and tell everybody that God exists and then and also you have to go and look for the Ark of Noe. Uh, so yeah well the short story is really uh, uh, yeah I would love to to have such a, such an experience. Uh, Tell us yeah. something of that short story again. I'm going to make a note of it and, <laughs> and yeah, this, Louise's as well. This short story, it's in this book. It's called like the story of the world in ten and a half short stories or something. It's by Julian Barnes. Um, it's really beautiful because all the short stories uh, uh, they are somehow related. So it's a beautiful example of short stories are like somehow a novel or a bigger structure that unites everything. Uh, and it's really good. I really, I enjoyed it a lot. And Louise I would... and I are both scribbling here. Um, <laughs> Bruno, there's something else I, uh, I need to raise with you, which is the X's that you've mm. used all through your novel. I'm holding it up. Can you see that? Yeah. Is it too close? Maybe there. So it's X's all the way through, and you use them for different uh, functions. You use them sometimes to show that a section has ended instead of punctuation. Um, but perhaps they have multiple functions. You use them to yeah. break up the page, almost like a graphic. Talk to us about your X's. Yeah, at the, originally, um, I'm a big fan of uh, Franz Kafka's novels, and in some of the novels, uh, he uses the Spanish columns, like they're like these two arrows. Uh, and I, I always said when I was young, like, okay, if I write something, I would love to have like this kind of dense novels with the dialogues inside the same, inside the same block. So, uh, so when I started writing the novel, uh, I had a lot of problems with punctuation in general. And I, I just read this novel written by Jacques Kerouac, uh, one of the first, it's called it The Underground or something. And he uses, as many other people, uh, like minor symbols, just like, you know, uh, to separate sentences. And that's super liberating because it allows you to go and to use that symbol or sign to really glue different type of sentences. It's also quite pared back and minimalist. It's 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 simplifying what you see on the page. Exactly, and it saves you a lot of problems to decide when, for instance, there's a cut in time and space. What should you do? Uh, I'm sure you have been through that. Like sometimes, like just to press enter, it's not enough. You you start to, to press like three enters or like to start in a new page. You know. <laughs> Sometimes you you want to have some white between you know blank page because uh, uh, it, even though you have to give the reader freedom, sometimes you know better like the rhythm or like the like the time you should take to read something, but that's impossible. That and it's not under your control. Um, so I decided to I, I started using like just simple arrows. Uh, for certain moments, and in a moment, like the arrows, like mixed together, um, and there was this infinite space between those, and uh, and uh, it was a bit unbearable for me. So I decided to use an X because, like, it was like the connection. And yeah, after that, I started um, exploring the possible uses. So as you uh, said, there are not. Uh, think like a group of functions uh, that describe the use of X's. And it's, it's hard to, to, to understand how did I use them, but in any moment uh, when I, I just re-edited the novel, 
the publishers, if they're open to work with me, they finally get the idea. Uh, for instance, now, like the, the novel will be published in Spain. This is like by Candaya. Mm -hmm. And we did the diagramation and the editor, Paco, he was really skeptical. He was like, let's do less excess. You know, I, I don't really like the excess uh, uh, or not in all, all, every moment. And I was like, yeah, sure, Paco, let's, let's, let's work on it. I'm really open. And after three hours of diagrammation, Paco laughed and he said to me, look, I know this might sound crazy, but I should, I should, I would add some excess here and I would add some excess there. And I was like, yes, Paco, exactly. After some hours in the trench, you know, like in the battle, <laughs> you understood and you understood like the kind of open logic of the, of the excess. Inversion to excess. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, as, uh, as the novel evolved, evolved uh, and did they have I a religious started... significance, Bruno? You know, an X is a cross, and there is a, a religious uh, undertone to the novel. Yeah, like, for sure. I would say that uh, besides the kind of obvious uh, Christian or Catholic uh, uh, sim sim symbolism and, and the obvious also like the excess in the maps I would say now and I'm, I'm just thinking aloud, aloud is that like what is an X really it's like a really simple symbol and it's about reunion no like the an intersection of two, two things and religion like the symbolical meaning of religion religio is like to reunite to re religare like to re you know, like to, so all religious are somehow communities that imagine themselves being like without something and they do certain things to reunite with something else. Um, and that's beautiful, uh, but also dangerous, right? Um, it's dangerous because it's related with power. Uh, but in a way, also the X, um, it's, it might be a symbol of the possibility of re reunity or you reuniting you, you, yourself with I don't know human experience in general and I would it say that look. it means look the X I think at this point we have to hear from um, the novel could you read us from Nancy sure sure um, um, I will read in uh, Chilean Spanish uh, it, it has this as I'm sure you are aware uh, Irish English it's it has also like its particularity. So, um, Chilean Spanish is also weird. Okay, um, I'll start, yeah? Please. Caminamos más allá de las cruces, detrás de la maquinaria oxidada. Tablones delimitaban el espacio en donde unas matas, doradas por el sol, trataban de mantenerse en pie. Acá nada puede crecer, me dijo. Todo se quema de la pura abundancia. Mucha sal. Luego de regar nos quedamos sentados, mirando el sol en su huida. Cuando el cielo se puso negro, ese día sin luna, las plantas comenzaron a brillar, algunas azules, otras rojas. Un par verdes. Miré a papá y lo vi sonreír de nuevo. Me quedé dormida con los reflejos de las plantas en los párpados, como si al cerrar los ojos apareciera el universo entero frente a mí, lo que se puede ver y lo que no. Desperté la maestranza. Nunca supe si esa puesta de sol, las matas fosforescentes, la sonrisa de mi padre, el día completo, lo viví, lo inventé, lo soñé, o un poco de todo. Me acuerdo, eso sí, de haberme vuelto a dormir y soñar cómo me hundía en su sobaco tras pasar el colchón y seguir del arco boca abajo a través de la tierra, los poros del salitre, cuerpos ovillados en sus ponchos, huesos de milodón en los que florecían tesoros, selvas de cuarzo y vidrio español, como si la tierra me dejara entrar lentamente en ella. 
Are you going to read it in English as well? Oh, uh, it will be translated, but I, I could do that. If Just give us you a want. couple of sentences in English, not the whole thing. Though it was lovely sure. to hear that Chilean Spanish, wasn't it, Louise? Yeah. Just, we a, tend just to skip... a sentence or two. Yeah. I do remember definitely falling asleep again and dreaming that I was sinking into the crook of his arm, passing through the mattress, on and on, face down through the earth, the pores in the salt pepper, pepper between fossilized bodies curled up inside blankets, bones of mylodons in which treasures were blossoming, jungles of quartz and Spanish glass, as thought the air was slowly letting me in. Oh, I'm reminded of the Joyce's, the dead, the ending, snow is falling, falling, you know, um, all over Ireland, over the Bog of Allen and so forth. Louise, would you read us a section from Snowflake? Yeah, um, so that was beautiful. Thank you, Bruno. Um, I, I'm going to read a bit um, about Debbie. Um, she's had a bad dream. Uh, she's talking about how, when she had a bad dream as a kid um, and her mom used to give her um, milk baths. Once, when I had a really bad dream, mom gave me a milk bath. I woke her by climbing into her bed and brushing my cold feet against her sleeping legs. There was a moment when I held my breath as she opened her eyes, but she didn't give out to me. She ushered me out of the bed and led me to the bathroom, where I was given orders to strip off while she got milk from the calf shed. I stood in the quiet of the early morning on the cold tiles of the bathroom floor and watched the water gush out of the taps, my arms crossed over my flat chest. Fresh ripples of goosebumps rose in waves over the back of my neck. The bruised light made everything blue. Mom came back in with a heavy bucket of milk and a fistful of daisies from the garden. I turned them over in the bath and watched as their white umbrellas bobbed upside down on the water, the tips of their petals tinged with purple. She tried to teach me how to hold my breath underwater. I lasted half a second before coming back up and thrashing water out of the bath. She shoved my head back under again, but I bit her finger. Then she dragged me out by the hair and unplugged the bath. I watched the drain swallow the heads of my daisies. Are you happy now? She shouted, her bark echoing off the bathroom walls. I was howling. Keep your head under water, she ordered. It will help you with the dreams. Lovely. Well, that's all we've time for, unfortunately, but thanks to our guest speakers, Bruno Joret and Louise Nealon. Thanks to you, our audience, and a special thanks to the Embassy of Chile in Ireland and Dublin UNESCO City of Literature for their support. If you enjoyed this conversation, you're most welcome to watch other events on Irish, Spanish and Latin American literature, culture and arts on the Instituto Cervantes Dublin YouTube channel. Follow the festival on social media and on YouTube and browse its events at www.dublin.cervantes.es. So it's goodbye from me, Martina Devlin, from uh, Bruno and from Louise. Supporting the arts. Supporting artists. Supporting us.